Hi, Felipe. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. <laughs> um, that's great. Um, I actually had the opportunity to watch Blue Beetle just last week, so, um, and I thought your cameo was really funny. So how was that experience? It was great, man. Um, they, they flew me out for two days because I think they were going through the COVID still. So they flew me out a day early so I could have a COVID test. And then um, I could be, um, I could get my results the same, the next, like an hour. Mm -hmm. Then quarantine for a day, not going to work to make sure I don't catch anything. And then they filmed it on the following day. But it took all like eight hours, not even eight, it took like six hours. I remember the actors that they, like, they know more of the SAG union laws. They were like, no, man, we're going to be done in four hours. You're going to make us leave before our lunch, our mandated lunch. <laughs> but uh, we, we made like, um, we still had an extra, extra an hour. That's the way those guys can have lunch. <laughs> there was good food, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I could see why they were crying. <laughs> so we know that you grew up in Boa Heights and you went to Roosevelt High School. So can you share about your experience growing up in the neighborhood? Yeah, man, I grew up right there, um, Pico, uh, Pico Aliso. But it was, it was um, well, I grew up in Pico Gardens, the Forest Street side by Pico and Glass, and it goes all the way to Sixth Street. Right. But then um, after high school, I was living in Aliso Pico. Man, it was rough. It was rough. Mm -hmm. But see, um, I guess if when you're part of a, already part of like this a bad neighborhood. Um, well, when you, it's a bad neighborhood only when you, when you leave, you realize and people tell you their, their version of your neighborhood. Oh yeah, it wasn't that bad. Huh? I just didn't notice it. But I guess it was, there was so much bad stuff that um, I guess you got used to it, I guess. A lot of us that grew up there, we have um, PTSD, you know, from watching so much violence and um, hearing so many gunshots, it was like a war zone, man. I saw a, uh, a, a kid, I was a kid too, I was 19, and this guy that used to live over there, he had a twin brother, and I, I saw him get like shot right over there at Hollenberg Park. Wow. And I was hanging around with those kids, we were like ditching school, and I said, I'm, I'm across the bridge. Those guys had got into an argument with those dudes at a park, and at, at, at 24 hours burrito place. I think it's a Panda Express now. <laughs> and when we, it was Taco Michoacan. They had a big sign, over a zillion tacos sold. <laughs> well, long story short, somebody was murdered. I saw a guy get murdered. And, um, and I was like, what the, you know? So it was crazy. And, and then I, I met Father Greg Boyle. And then he took me out of it. He took me to like a rehab. So actually, um, we listened to your Netflix comedy special the other day, and we heard you say that you were a troubled kid, and Father Boyle actually helped you like change your life. So what exactly did he tell you that convinced you to enter rehab? We were um, we knew Father Greg Boyle for since we were like fourteen years old, because he was the one of the, I guess he's a Jesuit priest, so he didn't, he didn't have a permanent church, so he would stay in Boyle Heights for probably like nine months and then leave for six and then come back one time i think he was captured by um by the um i think it was called the sandinistas and um during the nicaraguan war but they found out who he was and they released him i had him on my, had him on my podcast he told me that story but um he was um he was like we had a you know like there were never not that many um out out of school programs so every Friday, we would have like a youth program with Father Greg, and it was like teens, kids who were already like 16, 15, 17. And he would take us. I don't, know, I don't know what we did for every Friday, but I just know that every Friday night after that, whatever we did with him, we would go cruising to West Hollywood. Because I'm over there by UCLA. I don't know why, but we would always say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to that school one day, or. I'm gonna hang out right here one day, or I'm gonna hook up with her, whatever. <laughs> I'm gonna watch a movie right here, but it was always fun to go there. We got, we saw, we got to see like a different side of the city. Yeah. 
me distraí. <laughs> How does Father Bo still inspire you to this day? I think it inspires me, man, because um, when I when I want that, well, you know, he inspires me. Like he keep he keeps going, you know. Like he don't do it like for nothing. I guess like he don't do it for profit, right? He just does it to be a kind guy. I remember, well, you know, uh, after I saw that what happened over there, like my friend getting murdered, um, I was already a, I was a, I was a teenage father. I guess somebody got pregnant. Like somebody, <laughs> yeah, and um, he got he got this was before like jobs. It was not called um, homeboy yet. It was not called homeboy industry. It was called something else. It was called um, jobs for the future, and uh, the logo was jobs, not jail. Nothing stopped a bullet faster than a job, and that was like their motto back then. Before it was homeboy, jobs for the future. Because Father Gray didn't really have um, funds. Like now, he could go, he could go speak to somebody and throw a speech, and then people go, "Hey man, I have maybe fifty jobs available for the, they might last two years." So Father Gray or somebody that works for there could just send fifty ex cons or people in need of a job to go there. But when I was there, there was no speeches or nothing like that. Father Gray would, I literally, he'd go over there to that place and say this, the tell them straight up, no, we ain't gonna hire no cholos, no ex cons no heroin addict, crackhead. Father Gray would like, like a businessman, you know, like, never take no for an answer. He goes, yes, but how about this? You hire them for three months, I'll pay them. But let them stay there. And if after three months, you don't like them no more, we'll take all those guys out of there. But if you like well, some of them, just hire them. If not, I'll keep, I'll, and I'll replace that guy with another person that I'll pay till you start liking them. And that's how it started. Like a businessman. <laughs> yeah, so he was, he was paying out of his money mm-hmm. for someone to work there. Uh, so, what made you decide going uh, to go into comedy, and what was your life like before the last comic standing? Well, when we got into stand-up comedy, I was running out of things that I wasn't good at. I couldn't be no cholo, I like having long hair, and um, <laughs> um, and like my, I like my, I don't like, I don't like khakis. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like. Dad pants, man. <laughs> I wanted jeans. I wanted those. It used to be a brand called OP, Ocean Pacific. <laughs> they were like surfer pants. But I, I, my friend, we were not into that. We were not into it. Like, we were one of those dudes that we hear mariachi music, we would run, you know, like we don't want to get into it. And uh, we don't want to get into no oldies. We went with Don and Duran Duran, <laughs> and, and um, we like because I grew up in a very like machismo house, so it was tough, you know. Like we couldn't be sensitive growing up, you know. Like I make a joke about it now, so it's part of my new material. I'd say that a lot of the problem in my family is because my dad didn't let us be sensitive, you know. Like he thought if you're gonna if you if you cry for something, you're gonna go, you're gonna later on want to be with a man, you know. <laughs> if you're a boy, and um, and I make a joke about how growing up we couldn't watch Bam, we were watching Bambi, at my cousin's house. My dad was just looking at the boys, make sure they didn't cry, because <laughs> Bambi was died. Mom was dying, right? And I make a joke about how we were just like looking at each other. Yeah, this is the funniest part, huh? <laughs> Yeah, man, the way Bambi but mom burns, oh man, that's hilarious. <laughs> no, you're in cover on this. Right. <laughs> I, just, I just say that um, I couldn't cry for Bambi until I was 30 years old, all coked out in the alley by myself. <laughs> and then my friend comes in, you know, and says, Don't cry, homie, man. I couldn't cry either, eh? He showed me a big tattoo. I said, What is that for being locked up? Nah, homie, that's Charlotte's web. <laughs> <laughs> 
Charlie, bro. <laughs> my dad threw the book out the window. He thought it was gonna be gay. For like it to, for the one to read. <laughs> so after the last, the last comic standing, how would you say it like changed your life? I think when I won last comic standing, at first it changed for everybody around me first. Like everybody within a mile range of me. I was, I was the same person. When I won, I was getting messages from people that I haven't heard in such a long time. Like people from my past, when I, like when I was 19, you know, when I was growing up, I was a bad young adult. They go, oh, Felipe, man, I want $10,000 from you. I hope you jump this guy. Or I remember they jumped to nobody when I help you. And I went and I I went over there and beat everybody up for you. Or, or uh, stuff like that. But what happened was when they were asking everybody on Channel 4, NBC, like all the contestants, the top 10, and they were all white too, and a black guy. But anyway, I sent those guys home crying. And um, there, was, there was a guy, you know, with an American flag by his house. I want, he was eating corn, you know, like to be American and whatever. <laughs> and he was, I'm gonna buy a home, I'm buy a Corvette. And then um, whatever, everybody was, Thinking luxury, right? And then like, um, oh, how could I win America's heart? No, but I already knew what I was gonna say. I said, um, I'm gonna donate. I'm gonna donate some of my money to the man that helped me change my life, and when it helped me be, he was the first person I ever told what I'm gonna be. So I'm, I'm gonna donate my, my money to homeboy industry. And they were they were like um, they were struggling with funds back then. In 2010, and so when they saw them on the television, some people that used to donate but they stopped donating, they started donating again. So they it helped them. There was a big old ad for them. Plus, I donated too. Yeah. Why would you say that was like so important? Like, what was why was it so important for you to donate to to the homeboy industries? I, I thought it was because um, you know, what else are you gonna do? Who are you gonna give it to? I mean, I don't need a Corvette. <laughs> um, but also, man, people were hating, you know, like some some, some of the family members were like, oh, Felipe, I have a fun, a friend that just came out of prison and he's a heroin addict. Can you give him 10 Gs, loser, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, like I, I didn't even get a car. Um, I, 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 we got a Prius, right? Or if you're stupid, you're like, oh, gray, I would've got it in red, you know. Or, or I would've got it in purple, you think you're all bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, the, yeah, but my family very, my family very supportive. My father, man, he just, he passed away like two weeks ago. And you know, he, he was one of those dads that he never said like, I'm proud of you or, he called que chingón, cabrón. Nah, he just said that like, no juegue con monas, whatever, but, um. He was proud because I found out later on at the funeral, you know, at the funeral. I didn't go to the wake because I wanted to go to the funeral because that's the day where the wake, you know, like a, the funeral where everybody takes a, a day off from work. You know, like, oh, I'm going to take a day off to go to your dad's funeral. Those are serious people. The wake, they're like free. It's like a viewing, it's like a premiere. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, it was nice to see my dad's real friends there, you know, like on the home, there was a man there that he came, when he came from Mexico in 70, 72, 74, that, that was my dad's best friend, El, Pais, El Paisano. Yeah, but my dad, like, he gave me the best advice. He said that um, my dad used to work at, um, right here on uh, Whittier, or Nor Norwalk. He was a welder like a machinist, I guess, he worked with metal. And he, he would come home dirty, you know, like sweaty, all like, um, all red, all black, you know. Boots were all hot. My little brother and I would just take his boots off, like um, little elves, <laughs> take his socks off, it was all hot. And uh, he would just tell us, Mijo, I don't care what you're doing in life, make sure you get a job where when you come home, you don't have to wash your hands to eat. And then he said, we're all black and all dirty and I'm all, they were all hot. 
And that, I don't know, I guess he never got arthritis or nothing because I guess he followed the rules. Hands that hot, don't put them in cold water, just let them cool off by itself. So he would, have, he would have real hot hands and black hands, but he would wait to wash his hands and we're we'll already done eating. So his advice, his advice was, get a job where you don't have to wash your hands. So, so it didn't matter for me because I don't like washing my hands anyway. So, <laughs> nah, I got a job as a stand up comedian and I just hold a microphone and uh, I just gotta make sure I don't get, a, I don't get a carpal tunnel. I'm really sorry for your loss. That's all right. Thank you, man. You know, it's crazy, man, because you always think you're going to have time to say this, say that, but you don't have time for time for that. Time goes bad. So. And, um, but um, I had, I was, I found out when um, I was like, I was, I was um, getting my bags at four in the morning. I was flying to um, out of state and I was getting inside the Uber. And then my, um, my sister texted me that when I, was, when I got in the Uber, she said, um, my dad just died. And I got in the Uber and my, I started like, you know, she started getting all these emotions, but my wife hugged me. She felt weird already, but I just got in the car and um, I didn't wait to, I, I didn't wait to get all coked out to cry, but I did uh, in the Uber, like just, you know, like, you know, very solid, like, like Dr. Evil. And when I'm, his son told him, I love you, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that, part, that part always gets me because my dad never really, really said I'm proud of you or nothing like that. So I thought, and we never really told him either. So that part in um, Austin Power goes, because he got one of those little sharks with a raider or with a piece. <laughs> he goes, why did you do that to me? Because I love you, Dad. And then Dr. Evil goes, oh! <laughs> <laughs> Then he takes that little Mr. The, the little uh, mini me, thought it, he get, takes him out of the room. <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. How has your other family like supported you in your journey? I have like six brothers, bro, and seven brothers. I and mean, if you work, you grew up with that many people, man, you're, you're like, you know, you're really not together when you're adults anymore, man. You, you like the freedom of not being in the same bed or in the same room with each other. But they're very supportive, though. I have a lot of nieces. I'm very supportive. A lot of nephews. When they were like, when they, my, my, my little nephew, Julian, when they went to go see Blue Beetle, because they, they didn't really promote it. Nobody really promoted it because of the strike. But when he saw the, that part, he goes, Dio, it's Dio. I just got all excited. And some people also, too, when they saw me on that movie with Eddie Murphy, You People, and Jonah Hill. Oh, Dio. <laughs> I played a Jewish, a Jewish Mexican. So you mentioned before that a lot of your comedy is self-deprecating. Do you feel most comfortable in approaching comedy in that way? Yeah. Like before, like, um, yeah, self-deprecating. And I talk about, um, yeah, pretty much. Or my rela our relationship with my wife. And because she's white and she's from Ohio. You know, and so it's, we're both having a culture shock together. Like, and she goes, I've been to her town, you know, in Ohio, and they, um, like, some of our stuff is weird, even for us. But for me, their stuff is more weird, or bro, like, like there's a restaurant where they're known to eat spaghetti with just two sandwich cheese in it and chili beans. <laughs> I mean, that's nasty. <laughs> <laughs> also, they serve the, the two eggs with the chili bean, too. <laughs> but, um, but she never make a joke about she didn't want to have she thought all chata was gross. She was like, what does it have dirt on the bottom? <laughs> I said, it just tastes like that. You gotta mix it, man. She said, like, what does all chata taste like? Well, your wife from Ohio. To you all chata. Well, to me, all chata gonna always taste like all chata. To you, you're from the middle part of America, man. Or chata to you is gonna taste like cinnamon toast crunch cereal. <laughs> 
And I talk about how I went to a birthday party with them in Florida, and that was the first party that I've been to that ended. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody there, no one there but of the past. <laughs> People were leaving early, and nobody said, Ulero. <laughs> Besides like chili beans and spaghetti, what challenges or obstacles have you faced in your career as a comedian? Obstacles? Just um, the obstacles, the obstacles I've had in my career are the ones that I put in front of me, like falling off the wagon and drinking again and being a drug addict. That was an obstacle that I put on myself. I didn't really have any really face any obstacles that were placed by other people. These are just obstacles I created for myself. I guess because I know what I want to be, you know? Because I was in rehab, now I know that he's not a priest, you know, if I'm watching Natural Leaving It. I realize that guy was not a priest. I don't know who the hell he was now, man. Like, <laughs> he probably lied. <laughs> he was like a, uh, a, 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 not a sacerdote, hermano, a brother. He was just, he was a guy that's devoted to the, to the, to the church, but just like, just like a sister. There's a mother, and then there's a bunch of sisters, I guess. He's a brother. Last year, we went to go speak to people's homes who didn't have no money. And I guess when you have money, the priest, the actual priest, he goes to your house. So um, this guy would go to our, the rehab every week, and he'll talk to the man. Because our rehab was non-denomination. So you could be Jewish, Muslim, Muslim, Jehovah, or, or anything, as long as your goal was to stop using so every Sunday we would go to different churches. Me, I wanted to get away, so I would go to all of them. <laughs> so I would go in the morning to this hard, hardcore Christian church where everybody sat like we are in a, like this. And the church was just a guy speaking in front of us, like very chill, chill Christian church. Then we would go to a Catholic church in San Fernando. That was a ritual, it was a, it was a fun and shit. And, um, <laughs> And we go to a hardcore fundamentalist church in Burbank, California, I remember. It was called Burbank Community Church. It was Father, no, Pastor Dr. Jones. And um, crazy, man. That, that guy was like hardcore, man. Like, he really got us, he, he got the whole camp to not watch TV. Don't do not watch television, don't watch movies, put into the radio. This all a distraction from God that is gonna get you back into drugs. So we go to that hardcore church. All he did was hate on Universal Studios every week. <laughs> <laughs> so getting back getting off track, but that guy from <laughs> that guy that, that, that the the brother from San Fernando, he 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 would like talk to us and he was little activities. But he, he asked everybody what are your goals in life when you get out of here, when, what are your first plans, what are you gonna do, you know, what you gonna be, how are you gonna get back into society. So he gave us a list of right five, a list of five things that you wanna do in your life. And we're all like, I guess some of us never given that thing, that um, question. But a lot of the people that were with me were like 55, you know, 50, 46. I'm after like 20, 21. <laughs> Everybody writing like um, superhero names. Me too, right? Because that's what you wanted to be when you were little. Spider-Man or whatever. But then they said, nah, what do you want to be? Is it a doctor or something? So then I just wrote, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to be a comedian, stand-up comedian first. I don't know why I just wrote it. I wrote it real <laughs> fast without thinking. Comedian. And then... Um, um, my mom and I we used to go to um, Olive Garden, I guess, a lot. And then we said, I want to go to Italy. <laughs> to the, real, the real thing. And then the rest I forgot. Just be happy and not do drugs. And um, he, later, he, he said he did it. When we wrote it, he did um, We thought we were going to pass it to him, but he said, nah, keep it. He goes, now you have something to do in your life. You know, you have a purpose. You could accomplish two or five of those things because you're uh, you're you you achieve something in life. You what you set out to do, you set a goal, and you accomplish it. 
you now you have a reason to go out there, you know. So like, I guess I'm just a comedian. And I got a Tony Romans. <laughs> <laughs> Barrel of peace, I'm out of battle. That's <laughs> Sunday. No, reels, my bad, reels. <laughs> reels, right, I'm out of battle. So after pursuing comedy for so many years, what sparked your interest in, to move towards TV or film? When I, when I started doing stand-up comedy, I just started doing it because I just wanted to try it out. And I started meeting people along the way. Like, I met this comedian, Jamie Kennedy, when I first started off. And uh, he was living in his car, but he wanted to be more of an actor than a comedian. But I just wanted to be a comedian. I, still, I, I enjoy it, man. Like, I do an hour show and the next, on a plane or when I'm walking around the next day, I'm listening to the show and I'm trying to create more tags or more, try to add more jokes to the joke, you know, like, it's like, it's like you, when you write a whole essay, you, you read it over and over, but you never get it right. And um, I like it, man. Like, I, I meet people, man, that, um, like, when I was in Last Comic Standing, that's when, like, people, 2010, that's when people really started noticing me. And um, I, I went to places where, like, I didn't know the people, like, I don't even know who this guy is from right here, Pico Gardens. I went to a place called, um, we went on tour. When I won, we went on tour, like, all five, all top five comedians, me, um, Tommy John again, Roy Woods Jr., and some guy named Destefano. He passed away, by the way. Mike Destefano. So and I, and I was the last comedian to go, uh, and we were on a tour bus. The crowd were predominantly all white, like all white, blue collar, like blue collar. And we were there in Allentown, and I only heard of this place, like, because that, that, that's where, I guess, uh, they closed down steel companies in the 60s. That was one of those uh, big steel company. I think Billy Joe had a town. No, Billy Joel, that singer, had a song about that song, Allentown. That's the only time I heard of it. And um, I get on stage, and there's like this old couple, man. Like, they're like this retired old white couple. And they have a t-shirt that says, um, like um, a, a white t-shirt with a red ringer. It's, you know how they had those, both for Pedro? It said they both had Team Felipe. <laughs> nerdy white couple. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I thought it was cool that the other comedian had to see that for the whole show. <laughs> and um, I met these people who are, they told me that um, their mom was, their mom died and their, their mom had like some, some kind of, I forget what kind of surgery she was going through, but the mom, the, all the kids gather around her, her, I guess her, her deathbed. They were watching Last Comic Standing when I was on. And um, that's their memory, that the mom liked me. And that she was rooting for me. And um, even though she was there sick, she was telling her other kids, vote for him, vote for him. <laughs> so I get a lot of stories like that. And I get people who told me that um, they had like a, like a, almost like a Super Bowl watch party for the show. I made people happy. That's what comedians do, right? <laughs> What's your plans for the future? I want to be. A, I want to pr produce an executive produce and act on cartoons, um, yeah, cartoons or a television show. I've had um, I've had a pilot. I've never written pilots, but I've been in a, in a development deals like five times in a row. The first time we shot, a, we went to to pitch a show. Me and Dustin Ibarra. We were supposed to be brothers who grew up in, who live in Boyle Heights. I tell you the whole, the whole pitch, it was hilarious, but they didn't like it. You no, know? we, we, we set the pitch to the networks to, for ABC. We went downstairs and ABC, yeah, they want, we want to buy this story. We, we want to make a show. We want to go Fox and the lady at Fox. I wish we would have we went there. The lady at Fox, she, she looked at me and like she grabbed my, my arm like this. Well, I love this guy. Well, I love his brother. He goes, and then we have pictures of, we had a whole pitch. 
you know, like advertisers, you know, the whole page with us. The whole show, we have cars, like that, like that. that. She goes, I love him, I love him. Sold, let's make it happen right now. And then they went with ABC. And then when, when they wrote the pilot, they, they just said, nah, we're not gonna shoot it. And, um, and then we went a second time, different show, different idea. They said, all right. And then they wrote it, they didn't like it. And um, there was a one time, man, it was hilarious, it was hilarious, where um, Gabriel Iglesias had a, a pilot that year. Paul Rodriguez, Paul Rodriguez Jr., Cheech Marine had a pilot and a show together. Angela Johnson had a show together too. Eric Rivera had a show, Joe Lopez. Nada, ni mais. <laughs> you know what they say? They can't say no to all of us. Yeah, they can. <laughs> but you keep trying, man. You keep going. Like, George Lopez, you know, like, he never took, he never took no for an answer, man. Like, George, George Lopez probably been through the, what I'm going through. He's probably been through his whole career, you know. And, and George could have said, Charlie, I'm going to quit, you know. But I see, I see what he's doing as a motivation, you know, like, they said no to this. Okay, I'm gonna start my own restaurant instead. You know, I'm gonna start my own tequila shop instead. I'm gonna start producing my own shows. And him and his and his daughter, man, like that show, that show sprung about out of a TikTok during the pandemic. Everybody was out of work, and um, there was a, a beautiful scene with George Lopez and his ex-wife and his daughter, and. Um, it was just there being family. And then she meant she comments how they're not together no more. And I don't know what she said, but it was funny. It was funny what she said. And because her mom is, I don't know, she's like massaging him and he pushes her away or something. Hey! And it was just so funny. And that went viral and they have a show now. But there was the one time when they told her, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> But also, man, like, I don't get distracted, you know? Like, a lot of people were like, oh, man, screw that. But then you get, like, motivated, like, a, that guy on Chris Estrada with uh, Frank Quinones and this fool. Here's a guy had, who had a show with 7,000 followers on Instagram. And you know, you think, I, should, I need a million followers. No, nah, man, <laughs> you just gotta be talented. Also, man, check out my podcast. I have a podcast called The, the What's Up Who Podcast. And it just started out of nowhere, man. I was supposed to start a podcast. I was approached by Bill Burr and Al Maldihan. And um, they forced me to start a podcast. And I, they got me in the corner. And I, <laughs> Listen, you don't do nothing out there. And um, so we, we were, we're at episode 500, 400, no, 500, 454. Wow. So we had a lot of episodes. Yeah. And we've, we've had like... Um, my I, before I didn't I, I I would just find my guests off the streets like hey man aren't you that guy I grew up with they call vampiro <laughs> and he goes yeah and he goes come on and I, was, I have a show they go why they call you vampiro and then like oh man the grossest story you ever heard but um <laughs> but that was what, how I would get my guests like I interviewed um I was at Hollywood Boulevard and I remember I saw this documentary about street performers. And I saw the this guy, the black the guy, a black dude. He, he dressed like the Hulk. And he walks around Hollywood, you know, in the hundred degrees, and he's like wearing this suit. And he's standing like the Hulk for money. And I interviewed him. Interesting story, man. Like you talk about bad luck. Like this guy moved in to the the night of the riots in Los Angeles. What kind of Hollywood motherfucker? <laughs> nah, <laughs> nah, but and I saw I saw this guy. He was walking one time with his baby. I, I was getting my blood drawn, and um, there was a, a guy walking with his baby. He was, I love you, man. I I I voted for you when I was in prison. I was in prison, and I was and you and I was kind of standing. I got ever all my cellmates, guards. They were all voting for you, man. We were writing to people to. Telling people they better vote for you through mail. <laughs> and 
He had just got out of prison for doing 26 years, I guess, for murder. But it was a murder he didn't commit. He got out on the innocence program. It was a murder that he was framed and he was set up to, I guess the cops said, point somebody out and they got him. So he never did it. And uh, so he talked to, that was one of my guests too. He got out, he, he, he sued them and won $20 million. And now he's running for like city controller or he went to, he went to UCLA, got a degree, no tattoos. Like he just, I guess he was very confident that he didn't do it. Like no tattoos, no nothing. No, he's not bitter about life. So whenever I feel bad about something, I just think about that guy, man. Like 26 years for nothing, he didn't do nothing. And here I am complaining about Ingo Tonga. <laughs> <laughs> and I have another podcast called History for Fools. And it's just me and my friend, um, comedian Butch Escobar. We, um, we dissect stuff. Like, we, we get on, he reads, and I, I'm on Audible, you know. So he, we, we read, like, books about, like, um, um, like Watergate, Richard Nixon. So we did a whole episode on Watergate, you know, based on what we saw, the movie, the show, you know, the, the White House plumbers. And we get deep, man, like, it's just so deep. We did three episodes of that. We did a history of gangs in Los Angeles. We did a history of stand-up comedy, serial killers. And we're doing one of history of the first Chinese food in America. And that's that. Follow me at felipesworld.com. <laughs> so, but I'm very honored to be interviewed by somebody in my neighborhood. Thank you so much, Felipe. Thanks for having me, man.